Testing. Hello, hello. Well, good morning, Willidale Baptist Church. It is so good to be with you once again. I really missed you guys. I hope you can say the same. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as many of you are aware, um, I just, just about a month ago, I just arrived back from Peru. I was there for four weeks. As uh, that is my custom, I try uh, every month, to, uh, every year, sorry, to go for about a month, about four weeks. Um, obviously, to visit my family. My family, we are Peruvian, and uh, you know, to enjoy the, the beautiful weather, the cuisine. If you haven't tried Peruvian food, you have to. It is required for your salvation. <laughs> I'm joking. And uh, but mo most importantly, most importantly, we go for for ministry. So ever since I was eight years old, uh, we've been preaching in Peru. And uh, for this particular trip, it was going to be extra special because I was invited to be uh, one, of the, one of the guest speakers at a youth retreat in this, uh, this big youth retreat they did about, uh, about two hours east of Lima, which is the capital city of Peru. And um, uh, for those of you that are subscribed to my YouTube channel, it is the, the, the very last video that, that I posted there. It's just a, a very short three-minute uh, kind of summary of, of the trip. It was, it was beautiful. And uh, consequently, this, this was so cool that uh, I, I, I explained on, on several occasions that I grew up in a very uh, charismatic environment in many of the churches that I grew up in, and so preaching was always very spontaneous. Almost always every week it was, oh, you know, I felt the Spirit of the Lord led me to share this, or this story, or this testimony. Uh, but once I started preaching here at Willowdale, which is about, about two years ago now, which is really cool how time has flown by since COVID, uh, you know, I became, uh, I became accustomed and I grew to appreciate being assigned a task, almost like, almost like a homework assignment. One, because it makes the job a little bit easier because I don't have to think so much about what I'm going to preach, but it also helps me to completely digest and dissect as much as I can from the scripture that is assigned. And for this youth retreat in Peru, I was also assigned. I was very surprised by that because the churches there are also a very charismatic in nature. And so um, the pastors, this was a combination of two churches in the city of Lima. They were bringing up both youth groups. And the pastors, we had a meeting uh, about a week before the retreat. And they kind of, you know, went through all the details. Okay, it's going to be from this date to this date, uh, set place. And then we had to cover the material that we were going to preach on. It was uh, the youth leader of one church, the youth leader of another. And then I was the guest speaker coming from Canada. And so they gave us a sign, look, you're going to preach on this, on this, on that. On the, it was a weekend, so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I was assigned to preach on Friday night and Saturday, uh, uh, basically Saturday morning, like right before lunchtime. And so the, um, they assigned me, they said, for the very first night, Paula, we just want you to just explain. This is the topic of your sermon, who is Jesus Christ? And as a joke, I remember that I got up in front of all these youth and I said, Jesus Christ is God incarnate who died and rose again for our salvation. Thank you. <laughs> and I was like, just kidding, guys. So obviously that is all true, but I went into, into full detail explaining, you know, like the mystery of godliness, you know, that God was manifest in the flesh. A lot of you are familiar with that passage. And so, and obviously I went through details. And then the Saturday, so just before we had our lunch, uh, it was my turn to give the second sermon that I was going to give on that weekend, which is basically the gospel. So now that we've explained who Christ is, now we have to explain what he has done. And look, the whole, uh, just before I went to Peru, um, I spoke with Pastor Barry over the phone, and he told me that when I came back from Peru, we were going to do a series on the book of Romans. And I was very happy with that. I was very excited because that is essentially what the book is, you know, and, I, and I'm sure many of you have noticed the pattern by now. We've already gone, gone through uh, quite a few chapters in the book of Romans. It is on not only the person of Christ, but what he has done for us. You know, it's completely juxtaposed with our human sinful fallen nature. It begins with, you know, Paul proclaiming that he is a servant of Jesus Christ, a bond servant of his, and that he is not ashamed of the good news. He is not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for all those who believe. And then he goes right away in Romans chapter 1, many of you will remember this, explaining just the depravity of human nature. You know, just how, you know, how desperately do we need a savior? You know, how fallen is our nature that, you know, before all have sinned and do what? 
and fall short of the glory of God. Good, you, you paid attention to Sunday school, awesome. You know, and so he goes through, uh, you know, first of all, what is our condition? Chapter one basically focuses on that. We, what is our fallen human condition? Chapter two goes into, you know, God's judgment against sin is righteous and it is just and it is extremely inconvenient for us humans. But then chapter three goes into, okay, then how can we be saved from the wrath of God? Well, through faith. Not like right after the whole, you know, uh, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, and we are justified by him through faith. And therefore, he comes, he comes to the conclusion just in the first three chapters saying that therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So apart from anything that we try to do, our human effort in order to attain salvation, he's making a juxtaposition not only with human nature, but with the inventions that our fallen human nature has, has come up with in order to a, attempt to attain eternal life and attain salvation. Paul was speaking to a polytheistic pagan world, but even to this day, even within monotheistic religions, more often than not, it is a works-based salvation. What they would say if they were in the position of Paul trying to instruct people about how to be saved, therefore they would say something along the lines of we are justified by our efforts, by our rituals, our, you know, our sacraments, our effort to appease God or the gods, depending on what kind of religion or philosophy they, they subscribe to. And, but he says, no, we conclude because of how fallen we are and by how just God's judgment and wrath is against sin, the only way to salvation is through him. He must be gracious. He must therefore show his mercy through his son. Therefore, we can only be justified through him, through faith in his work, not ours, apart from the works of the law. And then we go into chapter four, and then he's, and he basically gives examples. So he's preaching, obviously, in Rome. The church in Rome was mostly Romans, surprisingly, <laughs> but also to Jews. There were Jews living in Rome, and so he was directing this at them, and it's still valuable to us now in the 21st century as Gentile believers in the Messiah. And he gives the example of Abraham. And even before, uh, today I was assigned chapter five, but just before I go into that, I wanted to give some context. Because also in Peru, I didn't even finish that story, sorry. Um, when, when I was assigned to preach the gospel to these young people, because many of them came from the church, obviously so they were believers, they had grown up in, you know, in the faith, they were also encouraged to invite their uh, non-believing friends or friends that had gone cold in their faith. And so that's why it was important to preach who Jesus was, who he is, and what he has done for us. And consequently, the, the, the passage, the main, obviously I shared the gospel, but the main passage that I read from was from Romans chapter five. And it wasn't until literally just last week I was assigned it once again. So I'm gonna kind of cheat today and just kind of translate the sermon that I gave there uh, in Spanish into, into English. But like I said, just before that, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, just go with me to Romans chapter 4, just the very end of chapter 4, because here's the thing. We as Christians in the 21st century, we are so accustomed to uh, chapters and verses. Oh yeah, uh, John 3, 16. We often forget that chapters and verses did not exist back then. When Paul was writing his epistle to the churches, including the Church of Rome, it was within the context of everything being read together. The assembly, the ecclesia would gather together and the pastor of that church, the leader, the elder of that church would say, this is a letter from Paul, the one who planted our church in this city. You know, I, Paul, a bond of Jesus Christ, da, 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 and he would address the specific issues and doctrinal, um, a doctrinal conflicts that, was, that were existing at the time. But he is speaking to an audience that knows who Abraham was. And, we talk, and he basically says that Abraham was declared righteous by God through his faith. So even before the full manifestation of the Messiah, you know, in the old covenant, people were saved preemptively by the grace of the Messiah, by their belief in God. Abraham believed God, not just believed in him, but as a friend, believed God. God's word. And that faith was counted to him as righteousness. 
And so near the end, so now this is, uh, like I said, chapter 4, um, in, uh, in verse 23, it says, Now it was not written for his sake, talking about Abraham alone, that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, who was raised because of our justification, saying this is the reason why Jesus came. Therefore, now we're in chapter 5, verse 1. When Paul says, therefore, you kind of have to read the verse beforehand. Therefore, having been justified by faith, he's already, he's already established that we are justified only by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was now given to us. Now this verse in particular is very underrated, because we are accustomed, like I said, we are so spiritually spoiled in a sense, you know, within the modern church. Oh yeah, the Holy Spirit abides in us and is with us. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. You know, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. We don't realize Holy Spirit. So if this is the third person of the Trinity, this is God, the Holy Spirit, and in literally in his name is holy, how can he abide in something or someone who is not holy? Even with, we see in the old covenant, you couldn't even touch the ark of God's presence or else you would die. And there was one, one man in particular who found out the hard way. So, and, but we expect it just kind of just waltz into the presence of God, you know, just as we are. No. He's saying we have peace with God through Jesus and he is the one who makes us holy. And that hope in Christ has now been poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has now been given to us by that grace. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, so he says, look, for scarcely for a righteous man will die. So even if there's a good guy out there, how many would be willing to give their lives for someone like him? Paul says here in this translation, scarcely. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that verse, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But like I said, within the context of a world where you had to earn your salvation, or, you know, or whatever the philosophy describes salvation as, whether it was uh, you know, achieving some sort of paradise or becoming one with you know, the spiritual realm, it was always dependent on you. And if you did not measure up, well, I'm sorry, you will not achieve that salvation. You will not achieve you know, that, that level of, spiritual, of spirituality that you want. But the God of Scripture, the God that Paul knew and preached and eventually gave his life for was different. You know, how many, you know, for those that believe in God's or a God, that demands a works-based righteousness, a works-based salvation, and there are plenty. How many of them can say that before I came to this particular faith, before I started to follow this God, this holy book, these teachings of set prophet, did this God love me as I was? Did he love me before I came, before, when I was a sinner? When I, you know, when I was not aware of this God, when I was living my own life, doing whatever I wanted, whatever the, whatever the flesh pleasured itself in, did this God love me? They cannot say no. I'm sorry, they cannot say yes. The answer is no. Only then, you know, there, we have, there are holy books outside of, outside of the, the God of the Bible that says that God loves not the unbelievers. And so therefore now juxtaposed with this God who he demonstrates is his love for us that even while we were his enemies, as Paul says in another passage, while we were still sinners in active rebellion and rejection against God, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, 
we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Like what he described in chapter 2. For if, if, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So here in chapter 10, he's describing two aspects of salvation. In the first part, he says, we were, while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, through, through Jesus. Justification, you are being declared righteous before God before you are actually righteous. This was one of the things that actually sparked the Reformation in the 16th century. Uh, now, Martin Luther had his way of describing, you know, the act of justification. It's basically, he, he described justification as being snow-covered dung. That's the way he described it. So before you're actually righteous, before you do any good, before you produce any fruit of the Holy Spirit, as, ha- as how he would describe in his letter to the Galatians, Justification is being you are declared righteous before God even though you're not. Because you are clothed and you are declared righteous only by the grace of Jesus Christ. Only by what he has done. So the righteousness of Christ comes upon you and you can stand in the presence of the Father with confidence because of him. But then something else happens. So you are saved by grace. You are declared just. That's what justified means before God. But then what happens? Okay, now you live a life pleasing to the Lord, having much more, now having been reconciled, you shall be saved by his life. He's talking about the next step, sanctification. By, by the way, don't get scared with all these theolo- big theological terms. Sanctification, you are being made holy. In Spanish, the word for holy is santo. I don't, how many of you all speak Spanish in here? I think there's like maybe one or two of you. So, so you know that santo in Spanish means holy. So you're being sanctified. You're being made holy. But it's, it says here, but this, this is what, like what blew my mind. Having been reconciled. So your reconciliation is not dependent on the works that you do. It's dependent on his work. So the way I love to describe to people, we technically, we are saved by works. Just not ours. His works. So having been reconciled, so now that you are already declared righteous, now you're saved, you're sanctified, you're being made holy by his life. So that holy life that Jesus perfectly lived for you and me and then gave on the cross, that life is being given to us through the Holy Spirit, which is given to us as a free gift. And so that's the thing. So we were already reconciled. So your reconciliation before God doesn't depend on, you know, the good deeds that you do. So you don't do good deeds in order to get saved. The gospel says that we are saved by grace through faith, and then you produce fruit. You produce good works because you are saved. Because you are so inspired by the love that God showed for you as a sinner that you can do nothing else except love other people as he loved you. It is literally that simple. And not only that, oh, Paul's not even done. (laughs) And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, in the next part of the chapter says, uh, the title that I have here in in my New King James says, Death in Adam, Life in Christ. Paul says, therefore, it's a good thing we read the context before, therefore, just as through one man, through Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, for all have sinned. For until the, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. Very interesting. I, many of you may have seen the pattern in, in many of the sermons that I've given comparing uh, New Testament passages with context from the Old Testament. Paul was aware of this pattern as a faithful Jew. He says that Adam, which by the way, for those of you that don't know, Adam in Hebrew literally means man. Jesus is described by many many Christian thinkers as being the first true human after Adam. Because Adam, mankind as a whole, was designed to be in perfect fellowship with God. The imago Dei, the image of God, 
was a creation of God that would, that would bear his image and share his nature. That's why, that's why Paul says that through sin, through our rejection of God, who is life, death entered the world. And consequently, separation from God because he is life. So Adam was the first prototype of this. He was the one who was designed perfectly by God to share fellowship with him, but he had free will. And he chose to fall, and all of humanity chooses to fall with him. But he is a type of one who was to come, a new Adam, who would then fulfill the purpose. And so like, I heard one Christian thinker say, Jesus, and this offends many people, Jesus was the first true human because he was God fully clothed in humanity. Jesus is fully human. We, we focus so much on defending Christ's divinity, for example, when you uh, speak to those who deny the, the deity of Christ, that we tend to forget to defend his humanity, the act that God was manifest in the flesh, but that through his perfect unity with the Father, he gave the example of what the true human is like. So Adam is the type, the prototype of this, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, big M in my Bible, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So the first Adam brought death into the world. Now this new Adam, this true man, has now brought life where there once was death. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life through the one Jesus Christ." Therefore, as, th as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justif justification of life. Just a few more verses left. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, he says the purpose of the law of Moses, what we know as the Old Testament, was to demonstrate to humanity the need that we have for a savior. But where that sin abounds, it says right here, but where sin abounded, demonstrated to all of us, grace abounded much more. Literally the power of the love and the grace of God that came through Jesus superseded and declared victory over the power of sin and death. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's just one chapter. <laughs> and look, something very interesting, just before I close, something very interesting happened when I was, um, when I was very young. I, was, I think I was 15 years old in Peru. And um, I remember that during this time, there was a, a Christian radio station in the city of Lima. And I'm actually still in contact with the pastor who was in charge of that radio station. He uh, invited me to preach at his church uh, back in 2016, if I, if I remember correctly. But I remember being 15 years old, and I was invited to speak on his radio program. And before, you know, before we were on air, they were still showing commercials and they were doing some other shows. Uh, him and I were were just in the booth, and he had a Bible in front of him, and he was also reading from the book of Romans. And at the time, I didn't speak as much Spanish as I do now, but I, I, I spoke enough that I could understand what he was telling me. And he told me that he had read the book of Romans hundreds of times, more than any other book in the Bible. And out of curiosity, I asked him, okay, well, why? Why Romans specifically? Because there's many good books in the Bible. You know, you have the Gospels, you have uh, Paul's other epistles, you have, you know, the stories in the Old Testament that, that many people love to read until now. And he told me this. Once you die, not just read, once you digest what Paul says, what, how he describes the Gospel in the book of Romans, you cannot fall for any other system, religion, theology, philosophy, that requires you to lean on your own strength for salvation. 
because Paul repeats his point time and time again. Our condition, God's condition as a holy and righteous God who judges sin because, you know, God is not only loving, he is just. In order for God to be perfectly just, he must punish sin. But how do you reconcile the infinite and overwhelming love of God with his perfect justice, which is just by his nature, he is a just God. The two things, and Paul recognizes, and he preaches this time and time again, the reason why he glorifies himself in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is because that is the intersection of God's love and his justice. Where sin is punished. You know, people, some people complain about the Christian, oh, you guys can just sin and do whatever you want, and at the end of the day, you know, you guys just get away with it. No. My friends, no sin is swept under the rug. No one gets away with sin. Sin always goes punished. But there are only two options. Either you pay for it, or you depend on the one who already paid for it. The one who went to the cross, demonstrating the love of God towards us, that even while we, being dung, basically like how Martin Luther would say, while we were still sinners, enemies in full rebellion and rejection of God. God demonstrates his love for these ones. He demonstrates his love for you and me. That even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are declared righteous by him. And then, you know, what do you do with a God like that? What do you do with a God who has given his life for you before you could do anything to try to achieve his standard of righteousness? I don't know about you, but I think the only proper response is to follow him. I think the only proper response is to then love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then because of the love that he showed you, that inspires you. Then you love your neighbor as you love yourself and as he loved you. If we can do that, like I, I suggest all of you digest this book. Any other theology that says it depends on you, your righteousness, your works, your ceremonies, rituals, sacraments, and then, okay, then, yeah, also God, God helps us with that. No, we are totally depraved. We were dead in our trespasses, but God in his love reached out to us. It is our job to take him by the hand and lead others saying, this is the way, the only way. Let us walk with him and let us love each other as he loved us. I bless all of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.